Hey, how's it going and welcome to another video. Alright, so I've had schlock on the mind lately. I don't think that's a sentence any human has ever said. But yeah, I did a video with Crystal a little bit ago. You should check out that video if you haven't seen it. We had a really good conversation. The topic of schlock came up in that video and it's kind of been on my mind since then. I've spent a while kind of thinking about like why it is that I like sort of like hokey messed up just like weird media. I'm a huge advocate for essentially like junk food media, I guess is one way of putting it, but yeah, I plan on doing a video where I talk kind of more in depth about my thoughts on what makes something schlock and why I like it so much. So it'll be a schlockology 101, I guess. I don't know. But yeah, I wanted to ask you guys and kind of get your perspective on some media that you really enjoy for being either a guilty pleasure or schlock or so bad it's good. Admittedly, the question was a little bit obtuse. I wanted to try and like get a variety of opinions on the subject, so I did read every response, even if every comment is not, like, in the video. But yeah, let's get into it. Slender Quill says, Yeek is an absolute disaster of game, and I haven't even played it myself, but it's always fun to dissect and make fun of every terrible decision the game makes. I'll often think about how it could have been great if the people behind it were more self-aware. Definitely fits the so bad it's good category. I love it. See, I think Yeek is a really, really interesting kind of thing to talk about because I feel like Yeek is one of those games where a lot of people have an opinion on it and most of those people haven't actually played it, like, including myself. Yeah, I've seen, like, the To Snaker video and uh, the Running Shine video and a couple of other ones about that game, but I haven't actually played it for myself. So I think right off the cuff, we're already getting into kind of like a, a sort of secondary debate about, like, forming opinions on stuff that you haven't actually consumed yourself. And I think that's especially very true of video games, which require a lot of player input. You know, it's different from something like watching an anime where, you know, somebody might walk away with a different interpretation of the show or the characters or whatever, but at the end of the day, they watch the same thing. With a video game, every playthrough is like very slightly different at least, so... So that's something that I like at least try to avoid doing is like sort of forming an opinion on something from the lens of somebody else. This is like a whole extra tirade that I'm going on right now, but I don't think a lot of people realize how easy it is to like manipulate people's perception based on a review. Because it is so easy to make something seem bad to somebody that hasn't actually played it. You know, not saying that Yeek is like some some victim of a, of a malicious gang attack. It is very easy to kind of present a lot of just like bad faith arguments and essentially kind of like trick people into assuming stuff about the quality of something. Again, not saying that you've been like duped, that you've been like hypnotized into thinking like an opinion that you wouldn't have formed otherwise, but at least for me personally, that's something that I try to kind of be cautious about. Ace of Diamond says, Oh boy, Project Cross Zone 2, hands down. This is my favorite crossover ever because it's so stupid and damn well knows it. You ever want to see the likes of Goro Majima, Phoenix Wright, and Heihachi Mishima all on the same team? It happens as soon as chapter 2 or 3 and that's only about a 20th of the cast of party members. It's so fun watching the various interactions of the wide cast of characters and while the story has some serious moments, I feel like it never takes itself too seriously. Here's an example of how schlocky the game can get based on those characters. I mentioned earlier, M. Bison released zombies onto Kamurocho and he framed Heihachi Mishima for it, implying that Bison is afraid of legal action. So Phoenix Wright and Maya show up to try to meet with Heihachi, their client, but have to be saved by Kiryu and Majima, the later of whom Phoenix has defended in court before with Majima deciding that not punching the judge was extremely helpful advice. Phoenix later learns that in order to assure the trial goes his way, Bison hired BB Hood from Darkstalkers to assassinate Phoenix because Heihachi's lawyer would be easier to kill than Heihachi. Phoenix basically only stays with the ever-expanding party moving forward because he would be immediately killed otherwise. It's just so dumb. I love it so much and all this is in the span of a couple chapters. It gets much crazier. Also, it has Sega to Sanshiro from the Sega Saturn commercials and his introductory chapter is literally one of the funniest things I've seen in a game. Yeah, I think most kind of like big crossover stuff, especially from a lot of sort of like totally disconnected franchises, that tends to be some of the best like junk meme, <laughs> junk media ever. Because I think it's one of those things that's kind of just like hard to do seriously, right? Like there's no logical reason for M. Bison and Majibo to be in the same plane of existence, right? You almost either need to like from the get-go accept that, okay, what I'm making here is not like a, a high level creation. Ryan says, Neil Breen's movies constantly leave you guessing if they're self-aware parodies or not. Fateful Findings is his most famous movie. A character takes his own life and the scene where this is discovered is the funniest thing I've ever seen. Yeah, I recommend watching the Your Movie Sucks videos about Neil Breen's movies. Those are really good. Juicy Rosie says, Battle in One World is incredible and I love how bad it is in almost every way. It's a baffling mess of bad decisions and it's hilarious. What's happened with Yuji Naka has made it even funnier since. 
Yeah, Battle in Wonderworld seems like just one of the most unfortunate, <laughs> like, stories in gaming recently, because, like, you'd figure that would just be such a kind of easy recipe for success, right? Like, Yuji Naka making this platformer game that kind of harkens back to, like, especially the sort of Sega Saturn era of kind of weird out there platformers. I know one of the guys who was involved with, like, Sonic's character design or art was, uh, like, responsible for the art for that game. Forget who it was off the top of my head, but... Yeah, apparently it was, like, mostly outsourced to some other company, and it wasn't actually done, like, in Square Enix. Also, this is kind of just like a funny aside. I don't know, does this count as funny? The guy was like arrested for this. But like one of the cases that was brought up against Yuji Naka for insider trading was he purchased 144 million yen of shares for the developer A-Team, who are the people that made Final Fantasy VII The First Soldier, which was that uh like Battle Royale Final Fantasy VII game that shut down within like a year. So to me, it's like of all the like insider trading that you could have done to just fuck your shit up, why that one? <laughs> like, Lick says, Who Killed Captain Alex is genuinely and unironically my favorite movie. The circumstances of the creation of the movie are kind of sad yet heartwarming and the actors and director are so passionate. Plus, even if it's not objectively good, it's really, really fun to watch. Also includes my GOAT, VJ Emmy. Brandon Gonzalez says, I really enjoy Shadow the Hedgehog for how over edgy it is with all of its curse words and guns and just all over edge alert energy. It acts as a perfect time capsule of early 2000s edge and has been something my sister and I have enjoyed since we were kids. I still, I still do a quick playthrough every once in a while and there will always be enjoyment for me in a story that's so bad it's good. Aw, oh, dude, I remember when Shadow the Hedgehog came out, I thought that was like the peak possible level of cool that could theoretically exist in something like that opening cutscene like i am all of me music video or whatever is to this day is one of the sickest <laughs> fucking openings in any piece of media like shadow had guns like oh man see i was a little kind of slow on the uptake for getting into more kind of like edgy sort of mature stuff while all my friends were like playing halo and call of duty i was like yeah but shadow the hedgehog Gibbo Yu says, Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 3 is one of my favorite movies of all time. Loved it as a little kid not knowing how shit it was, and I still love it now fully knowing how shit it is. Bully Maguire is a very, very silly and charming character. Oh yeah, dude, Spider-Man 3 is one of the best examples of like, I want to say unintentional schlock ever. Anytime fucking, like, mean Spider-Man <laughs> is on screen, it's just hilarious. Adobe Henchgirl says, Agent Ica from 1998. This is a show that has comical levels of fan service, but unlike something like High School of the Dead or High School DxD, where the fan service calls attention to itself near to the point of annoyance. Agent Ica you have to respect because of how understated its fan service is and how it happens naturally. Over time, I might have convinced myself that it's deeper than it really is, but one thing can't be denied, you have to admire the inventive perspective work and the animation quality. Ah, uh, perspective work, I see. <laughs> really a gem from the last gasp of Japan's economic boom. See, one of my greatest passions in life is like those weird 80s and 90s anime OVAs. Those I think are maybe like the, the fucking holy grails of just like weird we don't give a fuck kind of schlock. I kind of want to do more videos about those. Like, there's this one uh, OVA series that I'll probably talk about when I make my, like, schlockology video. It's called Mad Bull 34. It's fucking totally off its rocker. Honestly, I might do that as, like, a community post kind of video. It's like, what are some just, like, weird, fucky, like, 80s, 90s, like, Japanese anime OVAs that you know? Jaden Merced says, I've been recently re-watching the 4Kids dub of the OG Yu-Gi-Oh! anime. From the many times I've seen complaints online, I thought that I would hate it, but I found myself really enjoying it and actually getting invested in the characters and themes. Plus, the flawed dub does lead to extremely funny moments, whether intentional or not. Like when Merrick, an extremely evil bad guy, spends an entire filler arc just standing in front of a door trying to guess the passcode and failing. Oh yeah, for sure. Like, I think a lot of, like, late 90s, early 2000s kids such as myself are really, really attached to the 4Kids double Yu-Gi-Oh! I don't know, at least for me, I feel like it's kind of in this weird spot where... I, a lot of the time, I don't necessarily find it to be schlock, like, at least not the original Yu-Gi-Oh! GX is a little bit more kind of schlocky with its dub, but it's also not even, like, 
bad, right? Like, a lot of the characters have really good voices and performances. Most of the things that are, like, bad about it are kind of just, like, mistranslations or stuff that they had to cut out for, like, censorship reasons. I don't know if I'd say that the dubs are, like, a substitute for the original series, but they're not, like, the worst thing ever, you know? Brubo says, I don't really watch a lot of movies, but I really love the movie Hackers. I went into it expecting something stupid, but my expectations were repeatedly blown out of the water and into a hawk's mouth. Stuff like the main villain skateboarding in an office building, and the one kid who insists on calling himself the Freak. <laughs> that sounds like the name of either a really short-lived wrestler or a porn star. <laughs> it's a really fun watch and it feels super genuine and endearing good shit. Yeah, I also like a lot of the kind of like just weird, especially like straight to VHS movies, the kind of shit they would watch on like Red Letter Media. You know, a camera crew, a couple thousand dollars for effects, <laughs> and actors, maybe we have, like, a costume for a monster? Let's turn this into an hour and 20 minutes. Just, like, that kind of stuff I think is so cool. Dave George says, The first Life is Strange is considered cringy by a lot of people, but to me that cheesy, sometimes stilted dialogue is so endearing to the point where I probably wouldn't like it if it was polished. To me, it's a part of its identity. Oh yeah, Life is Strange is a classic. Like, I think that's a def definitely a good example of something that you should probably play, like, with a friend. I feel like it's the kind of thing that, like, at least for me, it wouldn't have had the same impact, I guess, if I, like, just played it on my own. I only ever played Life is Strange in, uh, Before the Storm. Fucking Before the Storm is, like, peak. <laughs> just getting into verbal altercations with people at all times is so much fun, but... Yeah, I never ended up playing Life is Strange 2 or 3, because it seemed like they were a little bit too, like fucking up their own asses about it, right? So I don't really have that much interest in trying those out. Vaunte Vaunt says, Utterly adore all three of the Fire Emblem Fates games due to the farcical nature of their writing and story. I like how you describe it as farcical. Because of the rumored lore cut down, writers supposedly made a 200-page lore bible, which they were then told to cut down to 20 pages. You have a beautifully awkward, haphazardly constructed world that looks great, with intriguing design elements, but it makes little to no sense. Because of this, a lot of supports fall into hijinks with a reliance on being funny. Hell, the same can easily be said of the game's story at large. The best way to read it is as schlock, because then all that mess becomes almost purposeful and really enjoyable. Like the world's shittiest D&D campaign. On top of this, because the gameplay is really strong in general, it makes it a really fun ride. Even more so if you randomize it. Because then you can plug your randomizations into the already schlocky story to create a legendarily humorous, interesting, or both situation in your head. See, Fire Emblem Fates is kind of interesting to me, because I find it to be, like, genuinely, I'm, I'm so serious when I say this, one of the most, like, fascinating sets of video games ever made. You know, everything having to do from, like, the story to, like you said, the rumored, like, cutting down on the dialogue to the, like, translation issues that it has. You know, that's a whole extra debate that you could have is the whole, like, the, the translation ruined it, like, that thing. To just everything, like, surrounding that game and kind of discourse around it is so interesting, and it is also something I don't want to talk about with anybody. Because I feel like that's one of those games where, like, whenever you bring it up, it starts, like, either a, a kind of, like, hate circle jerk or just starts, like, an argument. I, I kind of find it to be just, like, tiresome, right? I don't know, I'm the kind of person who, like, if a game comes out and I think it's bad or it's a disappointment, I try not to kind of linger on it. Yeah, I might, like, complain about a game for a week or so, and then it's like, all right, well, I've said kind of what I have to say about this. Honestly, in some ways, I almost find, like, those kind of weird anomaly, just, like, what happened here kind of video games, I almost find those to be more interesting than games that are just, like, good, right? I know that's, like, really weird, but I find that to be really kind of interesting to think about and kind of wonder about and want to dig more into is, like, those games where you can tell something, something went wrong, right? Like, the story of the how and the why is sometimes more interesting to me than the thing itself. So yeah, I think Fates is one of those things that's going to kind of live on forever as a kind of uh, source of, like, debate, I guess. Which is fine by me as long as it's not the same, like, regurgitated conversation about Fire Emblem Fates was so bad. It's like, yep, alright, that's, you've been saying that for 10 years, man. It's... Joe Lights Blue says, The whole Zoomer humor or YouTube poop types of media tend to make me laugh way too hard if it can catch me off guard. I know that it's literally the most nothing joke possible, but the bombardment of stupid information is really funny to me. Oh, same, like, I fucking grew up with YouTube poops. I know that's, like, a, a very corrupting influence on my childhood, but... I think that's part of why I tend to find just, like, really weird out of nowhere, super unexpected stuff to be really funny. 
So that's what a lot of YouTube poops kind of were. It's just like, how do we take this existing piece of media and just like fuck with it? GamerDude7576 says, I tend to lean towards older anime dubs and their animations, particularly the Lupin the Third early seasons. The combinations of weird left field English dub scenes always manage to make me smile, since it feels like everyone had fun recording their lines. Oh yeah, a lot of those like, old school, you know, 80s and kind of early 90s dubs and stuff are like treasures that should be preserved. Especially if it's a dub of any kind of like weird OVA. Oh my god. Because back then they didn't give a fuck, dude. Like, as long as it wasn't something that would get their production like literally shut down, they were pretty much down for anything. One of my favorite like examples of those is the, I think it's a 1986 Devilman OVA, like the English dub of that, is so fucking funny. I'll have to include this one clip. There's this moment where Akira is talking to this demon and the demon is literally incomprehensible. I have, I cannot for the life of me understand what he's saying. And it's so funny. What's the matter, pretty boy? Afraid of mums is seeing you as an ugly old demon. Yeah, <laughs> you're such a loser. Yeah, let me your <laughs> says, My guilty pleasures. Used to be SAO, not so much anymore as I got older. Sonic 06 is a guilty pleasure of mine as well due to nostalgia. I used to play it all the time in my grandparents' house. Dude, Sonic 06 was the first PlayStation 3 game I ever played. What a way to start off that console generation. Dio Branflake says, I don't care what anyone says, I really love the first two channel awesome films, Kick Assia and Suburban Nights. They're genuinely fun watches to have with your friends and it remains a mainstay of my list of movies to break out for a group watch alongside Equilibrium. See, I have seen Kick Assia, I haven't seen the other two, but that movie does exist. <laughs> hey, and I think they're especially kind of interesting as being sort of these like time capsules of the bygone like reviewer era of the 2000s right bro i have so much like fondness for that kind of era of the internet back when nobody knew what they were doing like the internet was just a totally uncharted frontier the the concept of record yourself talking about like a shitty movie and then showing it to the world was a new thing alas those are days bygone now orange and black five says Bloodsea was designed to be a dark and serious show, but it is hilarious to get a group of friends and tear it a new one for 12 episodes straight, culminating in maybe the most over-the-top violent episodes for anything ever, without ever crossing the line to being anything above passable at best. Would recommend. Today in News says, Resident Evil 6 is that piece of media for me. Its combat is incredibly fun and stupid in co-op, and the over-the-top action is hilarious. I also made it more fun by blasting ABBA music every time I played. Harry Hewson says, I thoroughly love death metal and the genre's inherent silliness and complete regard for your safety. Well, yeah, it is technically difficult to play at times. Trust me, emulation has some hard riffs. But at other times, it's so over the top that I just have to go, y'all really doing that? Oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> the elusive one says, The Room. It's a classic for a reason because Jesus Christ, it's fucking hilarious. Knowing how the entire thing was a behind the scenes disaster truly contributes to my enjoyment of this absolutely incredible accidental comedy. However, every dramatic moment falls flat, no exaggeration, and comes off as the funniest shit imaginable. I also love how the creator has fully embraced the film's place in meme culture and takes all the laughs in stride rather than getting mad at people that didn't have the same reaction to it. Just a great watch if you like stuff that's not meant to be funny, but absolutely is. Oh yeah, The Room is like for sure, I think, one of the kind of definitive so bad it's good, just like schlock things that was made by like, almost kind of by accident. <laughs> I think it requires kind of like a certain mind to create accidental schlock. You know, I consider myself a pretty good schlockster, but I don't know, I think it takes like a certain lobe in your brain being missing or like put in the wrong spot to like be able to kind of do it like by accident. Great Vegetable says, I think Honey Pop may fit under this category, although I would consider it an actually well-made good game. I mean, sure, at the end of the day, it's just bejeweled with yiddies. <laughs> yeah, yiddies. But I think the gameplay is so fun on its own. The characters range from alright to actually fun, and the dialogue is actually really good. I'd say it's less so bad it's good and more written off where it shouldn't be. Yeah, see, I think Honey Pop, like, unironically did a lot to kind of, like, change my perspective on, uh, like, my thoughts on good, quote-unquote, media. Because when all the, like, trailers and stuff for it were coming out, I was of the mindset that was like, wow, this looks so bad. And after playing it, I was kind of like, wait a minute, this is actually, like, really fun and funny. Like, the dialogue is really hokey, just, like, the concept of it is kind of ridiculous. So I think that kind of helped me to do away with that, a lot of that sort of, like, binary thinking that I would kind of fall into of, like, thing is either good or it is bad. 
As kind of like a quick aside, I think that's like a really, really fucking boring character trait to have as anybody who's like, things are either objectively good or objectively bad, and 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 I only consume objectively good media. Rogzer says, Persona 5 the animation is probably my go-to guilty pleasure anime. It's so bad it wraps around to being fucking hilarious to witness. It's the perfect anime to get drunk and watch with a bunch of friends, at least for me. See, at least for me, Persona 5 the animation is like, at least for me, it's probably even worse than just being like, schlock. It's very, like, viciously, aggressively okay. And I think that's, like, even worse than, than being bad. Because, like, yeah, it's got a lot of, like, funky animation and pacing issues, and it's not really a good way to, like, experience Persona 5, but, you know, to me, that's more like an adaptation that, like, they kind of tried their best at, and it just didn't end up being all that good. See, if you want to see some, like, Persona animation schlock, Persona 4 The Golden is probably the most, like, goofy, silly, just, like, they didn't give a fuck, <laughs> like, anime adaptation of the series. You know, that shit's hilarious, whereas I feel like Persona 5 The Animation is just, like, it's just there. What a Hoss says, For video games, Deadly Premonition is a great example. It has some seriously jank gameplay, the story is weird and makes no sense, and the game is full of bad audio mixing and stock sound effects. However, the town of Greenvale is surprisingly detailed and charming. The townsfolk all have unique personalities and schedules, and the main character York is such a huge weirdo, can't help but smile at some of the weird stuff he talks about. I can honestly see both arguments for the game being extremely good or bad. Personally, I love it because it's so weird and unique. Truly no other game like it. Isn't that right, Zach? See, I've been meaning to play Deadly Premonition for a while. I've, I've had it on Steam for forever. I just haven't gotten around to it, but at some point I definitely will. I don't know, I always enjoy weird sort of like, just like, what happened here <laughs> kind of experience, right? Ion says, I like the Erage series, how do you say this? Taimanin Asagi, because it unironically put too much effort into its world and characters, to the point it made me join the official Wicked crew and make fanfiction to improve and fix on the glorious mess it is. Damn, that's dedication. The other day I saw your cross and video, I was playing Super Robot Wars V when they showed up. I still think the show is bad, but it has schlock value. Oh yeah, for sure, like, cross and is pretty peak schlock. I think that's one of the best, like, just totally unhinged, like, they just didn't give a fuck <laughs> kinds, of, kinds of shows ever made. I have a, like, I think it's like an hour-long video talking about that if you want to go watch it. Crest Ribbon says, Ruby is such an inconsistent mess, but I've been a fan of it for so long, it can always bring a smile to my face. See, I find Ruby to be a really, really interesting series because I kind of feel like, like, you know, this is just my own experience, but I feel like I've encountered very few Ruby fans where there's no caveat to, like, their enjoyment of it. I feel like most of the time whenever I talk to somebody who's into it, it's like, yeah, I was really into Ruby when I was a teenager and I kind of just stuck with it. Or it's like, yeah, I love Ruby because it's just a weird mess and I like that. I don't know if it's the kind of thing that I would, like, really be willing to sit through, because I feel like it's it's one of those things where, like, you kind of need a sort of, like, an emotional or nostalgic attachment to it, right? And I'm not really a big fan of the concept of, like, hate watching stuff. I think that's kind of, like, a, a sort of negative thing to do is to be like, I, I will watch this thing purely to talk shit about it. Because obviously you're just going to go into it with, like, a negative expectation and leave with, like, a negative outcome, so there's not really been a whole lot accomplished there. Mad Bro Shio says, The anime misfit of Demon King Academy definitely. It's like if One Punch Man had zero self-awareness and was somehow even more overpowered. And the protag has banger lines like, Did you really think killing me would make me die? <laughs> and other ridiculous one-liners that 12-year-olds think are cool. It's to the point where I'm constantly questioning if it was the author's intention to make it hilarious, because some of it seems too perfect to be accidental. Yeah, I find that's like a genre of schlock, I guess, that's never really appealed to me, is the like, power fantasy kind of like, I bet if you were a 14-year-old boy, you would find this so cool, like that kind of media. Like, One Punch Man is different because that has, like, really cool characters, and it has a good sense of humor, it has good fights. And so it kind of, like, it balances the comedy and sort of, like, the ridiculousness of the concept while still being, like, a serious piece of media. So yeah, that's the kind of stuff that, like, I find just doesn't really do a whole lot for me. But I think it definitely gives rise to a lot of kind of interesting debates about, like, author intent and if this is, like, on purpose, right? If you've never seen the movie Crawl, take a high fantasy setting with knights, wizards, and the Cyclops, then put in an alien invasion. Wait, that sounds sick. I saw it when I was five back in 1983. And I've probably seen it more times than I've seen The Sunrise. It was Liam Neeson and Robbie Coltrane's first movie, huh? And an absolute legend. Huey says, Tim and Eric Awesome Show, great job. Oh man, I remember Tim and Eric Awesome Show. I think part of why I liked it so much is like, it, it kind of just was a YouTube poop on television. It was just this really strange, irreverent, like, 
oddball show that I think I highly recommend anybody who's into just like weird stuff check out. Tabuki Sama says, The Super Mario Brothers Super Show is so goddamn ridiculous and it lacks all cohesion, but it's so damn iconic and Lou Albano, may he rest in peace, is probably my favorite voice for Mario. Not counting Charles Martinet, of course. This isn't even mentioning the amazing intro and outro songs. Both the raps and the Do the Mario are legit some of my favorite songs ever. I'm so happy the Mario movie used the first Mario rap and made it available on Spotify. Forgotten Hope 26 says, I will probably find an angry mob outside my house for implying they're bad in any way, but for how little sense the Bionicle movies make to anyone who didn't grow up with them, I still treasure them to this day. Just a little guy. Oh, he's a little fella. I watched Domestic Girlfriend after watching a Gigguk video, and yeah, it was certainly an incestuous romantic dumpster fire that I couldn't look away from. Cancer Cinema says, Power Rangers slash Super Sentai, easily. One of the most mainstream things to call cringe in the US, at least when I grew up. Always love the over-the-top theatrics and drama, supreme schlock. See, I've actually had my tokusatsu cherry popped re recently. I started watching Kamen Rider X-Aid with a friend. The show is fucking mental. It's about a group of gamer doctors fighting uh, these monsters called Bugsters. And all their power-ups are based on different like genres of video games. So there's like a rhythm game power-up. There's like a puzzle game power-up. Just completely insane. But yeah, I'm definitely interested in checking out some more once I'm finished with X-Aid. Stargobble says, I'm big into Dragon Ball What If videos and What If videos in general. I wouldn't consider them to be high entertainment as most of them are brief summaries of an entire show's scenarios and depicting how one small change can affect the rest of the story, usually without diving into all the dialogue that could help to flesh out the newly interpreted characters. But it's really fun to imagine alternate scenarios like if, as an example, Nappa turned good. Because even if that makes literally no sense for the character, it's fun to watch the dominoes fall and the rest of the work as the YouTuber balances the story flow while also making the character involved in the change stay relevant and different from the original work. Oddly enough, I just realized the Jodo Pitbull video works as a perfect example, a narrative question nobody asked, but one that radically changes the story by its very nature and in a way that makes you reevaluate, imagine, and experience part 5. Damn, that video sounds like it go crazy. I think both that ability to allow you to relive something almost for the first time, and the desire of most people to want to go back and do things over again to see how they change, compound to make it very interesting content. Even if a lot of them devolve into side character becomes the ultimate strongest guy equal to the main character, because of their unique Omega Dude mode, and they get an even better ending than in the canon story. I've seen maybe three what ifs ever end worse or weaker than the canon story, and one of those got retconned in a follow up video, but I don't mind at all. As long as the vid is fun and explores some unique concepts, I'm down for some stupid matchups like Yamcha beating Jiren. Dragon Ball in particular makes for excellent what ifs because the entire cast, apart from Goku and Vegeta, are so completely shafted at almost every opportunity it's not even funny. Oh, dude, Dragon Ball what ifs were my shit back in the day. It's kind of funny how Dragon Ball kind of like does its own what ifs. Ever since like Budokai, and honestly probably like even going before that in some of the like Super Famicom games, they would do shit like the classic, oh what if Cell absorbed Krillin. <laughs> like, yeah, I have a lot of fun doing what ifs. I'm, I'm currently in the process of editing, uh, what if the investigation team ended up in One Piece? Just this totally out of nowhere concept that does, does, doesn't even make any sense, but... It's actually really fun and kind of interesting to kind of think about, like, what would these characters do in this setting? Sort of an interesting, like, mental exercise. Grant Barbarito says, I feel it's wrong to suggest Riverdale here because it is genuinely fantastic in some regards. You sort of have to understand it on a higher level <laughs> to truly really enjoy it. But if you can, it is some of the most enjoyable media I've ever experienced. It is wholly unpredictable and often very funny. Its characters are likable and well acted, and its breakneck pace of introducing new ideas is balanced by longer and more developed plots. It is a genuinely extremely fun show that I don't think a lot of people respect. Dylan Yoshi says, Street Fighter the movie is amazing. Its plot is goofy nonsense, but that's exactly what's fun about it. There's so many silly fun moments, like when M. Bison uses a Street Fighter arcade stick to remotely detonate explosives, or when Guile gives his dumb stick it to the man speech. But some of the characters really shine. Zangief has some of the funniest quotes of the movie. He was literally working for M. Bison because he didn't realize Bison was evil, and switched sides to the moment he was told Bison is the bad guy, and Sagat is incredibly hammy. But the real MVP is Raul Julia as M. Bison, who gives a genuinely incredible performance. Every single line that he says is perfect for the character. His speech about how he's upset that the media calls him mad and that in his mind he's actually conquering the world, not for evil but for good, is one of my favorite speeches in the history of cinema. This Bison performance is evil 
easily my favorite the character has ever had, and Raul Julia's incredible acting is the reason why. Raul Julia had been diagnosed with cancer and did have much longer to live, but still gave this role everything he had, and I am forever grateful. Giggix says, I love Blaze Blue's story despite it being complete brain fuck if you think about anything for too long. Still, I played through every game for the story. See, I wish I had like a better experience with Blaze Blue. I, this is probably my own fuck up, but like I picked it up with Chrono Phantasm and it did very little for me, which is kind of weird considering how much I love the Guilty Gear story. So I don't know, maybe if I go back to it and I kind of like start from the beginning, I'll be more into it, but maybe someday. Notapop says, Xavier Renegade Angel is both my guiltiest pleasure and the best show of all time, I think. Bro, Xavier Renegade Angel is one of the greatest, like, works of humanity. That show is awesome. Xavier Renegade Angel was kind of ahead of its time. It has that, like, really weird sort of almost meta shitposty kind of humor that you see a lot of nowadays. So if you want to see, like, just this really odd sort of, like, something that feels like a weird fucking meme that you would see in the current year, but it was made in fucking 2007 and looks like shit. <laughs> you should, you gotta watch Xavier Renegade Angel, dude. Sean McMillan says, Michael Bay Transformers movies and the Fast and the Furious movies. I don't care how little sense the plot makes, it's just kind of fun to watch big robots blow stuff up. And it's kind of hilarious how little the Fast and the Furious movies care about the laws of physics. See, the Transformers movies kind of take me back to the, like, you know, 2000s and, like, kind of late 2000s era of, and I guess kind of like the emergence of people realizing that, oh, wait a minute, negativity gets clicks, right? Like, we brought up uh, the channel Awesome, like, Nostalgia Critic kind of people, but that's definitely kind of what I'm talking about, though, like, this thing is bad, and this is my video about it, like, when this kind of stuff was just starting to sort of blossom. I don't know, I don't feel like too many people were going around acting like Michael Bay Transformers was like high art. It was just some dumb, goofy, stupid bullshit. <laughs> Bruno Spinelli says, Stranger of Paradise, hell yeah. I really like the actual gameplay, but the story's as schlocky as it could be in the beginning, with lots of lines that made me lose my mind and only a few bits of character development throughout. But when you get to the final stretch and there's suddenly a really done relationship between some of the characters, and I noticed I actually cared a bit about the characters, it just went from great in an ironic way to actually great. Bro, Stranger of Paradise might be my favorite, like, game that I expected to just be actually bad that I ended up kind of really, really liking. Jack is just such an over-the-top, ridiculous fucking, like, meme of a character. So yeah, Stranger of Paradise was kind of a, a nice surprise. Some jabroni says, I recently played the game Boyfriend Dungeon. It's basically like Hades plus Persona and it's super schlockino. <laughs> Wait, that sounds sick. How does that work? I need to look into this. <laughs> What's Boyfriend Dungeon? Oh shit, it's on Steam? Oh fuck. What is this game? <laughs> this looks awesome. Wait, this looks awesome. Wait, okay. <laughs> Your weapons like turn into boys and then you can like romance them and that's how you level them up. Wait a minute. <laughs> The weapons are called Beyblades, spelled B-A-E. <laughs> this looks like some good schlock. 1986 Toyota Sprinter Trueno says, I like this YouTube channel. The guy talks about ST Persona and other anime stuff. His name's Smither. He's pretty funny. I might have to check him out sometime. Sir Squiggleton says, Season 1 of Sympho Gear is an absolute trash fire where the budget was so empty that at one point they introduced telepathy so characters could talk to each other without having to animate mouth movements. No way. Wait a minute. That's so fucking gigabrained. <laughs> Thankfully, the series became a cult hit and because it was a vanity project, it kept getting more seasons and gained a larger budget, which allowed them to have very impressive animation. Despite having this larger budget, it still followed no logical structure whatsoever. And everything that happens is utterly deranged. I love every second of it. Riley Speck says, Madaka Box is a god-awful manga that goes from school slice of life to battle manga, to battle manga that parodies battle manga, to battles featuring antagonists that fight using the Japanese language. It does not translate into English. I'd imagine not. But even before that, the powers and logic of the characters used were so batshit nonsensical that I couldn't help but enjoy it. Definitely worth a read, especially the first Kumagawa arc. Man, doesn't that suck whenever there's something that's like, yeah, this is peak fiction, it's like the greatest thing ever? It's impossible to translate. Damn, Japan, why your language gotta be so complicated? Salen says, I enjoyed the story of Fire Emblem Warriors 1 a lot, even though it's literally just fan fiction and the most fucking schlocky shit they could come up with. Same goes for Hyrule Warriors 1. I kinda just enjoy random ass characters in the series talking to each other, even if it's like because of genuinely dog shit story writing. Lemon Jam says, 
Conquer's Bad Fur Day is a game I would recommend to no one, <laughs> but I will still sing the praises of it until I am dead. It's a game that was incredibly influential to who I am as a person, my sense of humor, and aesthetic preferences. Specifically, my adoration for juxtaposition stems from Conquer juxtaposing its bright world and characters with mature concepts, which is a lot more mind-blowing back in the day than it is now. Yeah, I, I definitely feel like the whole kind of like bright, happy setting, but like it's it's dark thing is kind of like, okay. <laughs> it's, however, it sucks in almost every way. It controls like shit. It doesn't look great. And its comedy is deeply unfunny <laughs> looking back on it. Nostalgia totally fuels my love for it. And I wouldn't blame anyone for picking it up and not understanding the hype. Yeah, I think I'm somebody who at least kind of has the good sense. I feel like this is a superpower that's very much missing on the internet is like the ability to look at media and kind of like how people feel about it with kind of like a nostalgic lens and stop and think and be like, okay, maybe I won't have this. It won't have the same effect on me as a grown man that it did for somebody when they were like six, you know? I think that's probably how I would end up feeling about a lot of those kind of like N64 platformers. This is like, it's just a genre that I never really grew up with. So I have no particular attack attachment to it, so I can't really see myself getting all that into it. Amaterasu says, I like how being a Sonic fan, no matter what game, is automatically a take where you have to shame yourself for enjoying the game. This is really true. Especially with any of the, like, 3D ones, I feel like you're almost expected to kind of, like, present your evidence or something. But Xenoblade Chronicles 2 is probably that game for me. The game is so unbelievably flawed, but it is also my favorite in the series. It's not nearly as low rated as other games here, but as you said in your Xenoblade video about how divisive 2 is, that's just to do with the actual quality of the game. It has terrible quality of life features, a legit gacha mechanic inside of a single player game, and very questionable voice acting. Or rather direction as the voice actors are actually pretty amazing, but the lines just sound out of context every time. Bro, I can't wait to play that game. I'm probably going to give it a shot, like, pretty soon. Ogopogo Agogo says, A lot of Godzilla films fit this bill, but if I had to pick, it would be Godzilla Final War. It's practically a preteens fanfiction turned into a film that's one part Godzilla and another part Matrix wannabe, or a mutant alien task force fighting alien invasion of Hammy Green Day members. Add in scenes like our leader Ozaki sucker-punching his rival with the back end of a motorcycle, Godzilla fighting three monsters at once, and even using one of them as a soccer ball mid-combat. MMA fighter Don Fry driving a flying drill submarine super weapon, the most edgy redesign of cyborg chicken kaiju by making Gigan red black and giving him literal chainsaw hands. Godzilla killing the bad 90s remake version of the Big G with ease to the song We're All to Blame by Sum 41. Ozaki basically going Super Saiyan to power up Godzilla to defeat Kaiser Ghidorah, the most powerful Ghidorah ever, by launching him into space with his atomic breath, and an ending where Manila slash Baby Godzilla and a random kid T-pose in front of Godzilla to make him no longer <laughs> want to kill humanity. All alongside some of the best suitmation and monster versus monster fights in the series, you get this lovely mess of a film coded in early 2000s Ed. See, Godzilla is hilarious because of how, like, dark and serious its like original intent was since godzilla was kind of designed to be this allegory for like nuclear weapons and like environmental devastation and just the suffering that the japanese went through during world war ii and over time he kind of just became this like bizarre inversion of himself who would do like funny dances and had a baby robert orzel says i could basically just put b movies but the wildest piece of media ever is the whole 70s turkish cinema especially their action movies which due to a lack of copyright laws illegally use soundtracks characters and even whole scenes from well-known hollywood movies the best known and my favorite are three mighty man which is basically captain america and el santo teaming up against evil spider-man with james bond soundtrack and the man who saved the world aka turkish star wars nova x says smt4 apocalypse my man Man. As long as the game has fun combat and cute waifus, I'm satisfied. I don't know why people want more than that. See, this truly is the greatest trapping of modern society is that our ancestors were content with cute waifus and fun combat. I'm just saying, ever since then, global happiness has been steadily decreasing. But yeah, I love SMT4 Apocalypse. That game is so cuckoo. Philip Webb says, I swear I'm not a boomer, but Plan 9 from Outer Space is a classic one. Nonsensical plot, cheap and terrible effects, even for the 50s, and full of unintentionally hilarious quotes. Car the Best says, Anonymous Agony is a game I am incapable of being normal about. <laughs> it crashes by doing the weirdest of things, the story is insanity, and the whole game reeks of early 2010 edginess, and I fucking love it. I don't know what it is about it, but I'm just so fascinated by it. It's about this teenager called Hayes whose sister got diddled, and now he has to become the pedo hunter extraordinaire, all while white, white boy rap music players the entire game. 
All right, and our final submission here from Xavier Walker, who says, G Gundam is good, but also bonkers. Hell yeah. Bro, I love G Gundam. I think G Gundam is one of the best, like, things that are schlock, but also just, like, legitimately good. It's kind of a hard balancing act to pull that off, but G Gundam just takes this, like, totally ridiculous concept of every nation having its own Gundam, which are all hilarious, by the way. Like, Mexico has the Tequila Gundam, just, like, just stuff you would never be able to get away with nowadays. And having just this, like, planetary tournament between them all. But yeah, thank you so much to everybody who made a submission. Sorry I couldn't get to every single one of them, but, you know, I would be here all day if I read them all, so. Yeah, it was definitely interesting seeing what you guys kind of thought about this. Like I said, the original question might have been a little bit obtuse, but I think I definitely got some interesting answers. I think it kind of broadened my horizons on what you guys consider to be schlock or like guilty pleasures or so bad it's good kind of stuff. But yeah, thank you all so much for watching. Look forward to Schlockology 101 or whatever I end up calling it when I get around to it. But yeah, I'll see you guys next time.